Please welcome Unrig Summit director and a marvelous person you should thank, Nora Gilbert. Thank you. I realize I'm actually mic'd here. I don't need to talk into this one. Um, here we are, final day of Unrig 2019. I can assure you that no one is as excited as I am to welcome you to the last summit, <laughs> the last session of the summit. For those of you who weren't there last night, I just want to recommend that you check out the live stream immediately. It can be found on the Unrig recap page. It was an incredible show. It was so much fun. If you missed it, you can still watch it there. Even if you went, you can still watch it there, so you might want to go ahead and bookmark that page. And when you've been in the weeds of planning an event like this and really focusing on all the little details, it's really easy to lose sight of sort of the big magic of what something like this is. And it's been, it's been amazing over the last three days to realize that it's not about the venue and the room layouts and the schedules and the staffing plans, but all of the people that came to fill those rooms and the amazing programming that all of you helped build out to put in those sessions and the phenomenal partners and of volunteers and staffers that made all of it happen. So thank you to everyone that did that. And admittedly, I haven't slept a lot in the last few days, but I am feeling very energized by what's happened here in Nashville this weekend. And it's been so rewarding to celebrate the victories of the last year together. And it's been so inspiring to see these new connections forged and new partnerships built and new campaigns catalyzed. And I can't wait to see what comes out of it. So thank you to all of you that made this such a valuable way to share and celebrate what has come before and to get really motivated and excited about what's coming next. And I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us in Nashville and proving that this movement to unroot the system has more momentum than ever. So. Thank you, and congratulations to all of you for being a part of that. So without further ado, let's get started. Nick Traiano is the executive director of Unite America, a movement of Democrats, Republicans, and independents committed to bridging the partisan divide in order to tackle our nation's biggest challenges. Please welcome Nick to the stage. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. In 2013, after the government shut down over bitter partisanship, I did what any normal 25-year-old would do. I left my party and I decided to run for Congress as an independent. Uh, anyone here ever run for office before? Anyone here thinking about running for office in the future? Where's, where's Howard? Okay. Uh, in 2014, we wound up running the most competitive campaign for Congress against two major party candidates in at least the last decade, which means that we got 13% of the vote. <laughs> I saw up close how the system is rigged. I had to get two and a half times more signatures than either of my opponents to get my name on the ballot. The incumbent congressman raised over a half million dollars from special interest PACs just by virtue of what committees he sat, sat on. So I committed myself since to helping to level the playing field for new competition, because in a country that has over 5,000 types of breakfast cereal, we ought to have more than two choices for our political leaders. And that's why I'm really excited to introduce our next two speakers who are rolling up their sleeves to do something about our broken two-party system. Howard Schultz is one of our country's most successful entrepreneurs, not only creating a global brand and company from virtual scratch, but also an entire industry. What I admire him most for, however, is his commitment not only to profit, but to putting people first too in Starbucks by giving company ownership and healthcare even to part-time employees. As you may know, as you may know, Howard's thinking about running for president as an independent candidate, and I can tell you this, working in independent politics for over a decade, no one thinks about running for office as an independent because it's an easier way to get elected. They do it because they believe in their heart of hearts it's the right thing to do. And I think in considering running as an independent, he's already demonstrating the kind of courage and conviction that is missing in our politics today. Catherine Gale is the former CEO of Gale Foods. 
Her work with Harvard Business School's Michael Porter was a seminal contribution to our movement and inspiring for many people, including myself. She's been a pioneer in this space and her passion is contagious. Uh, last year, you may remember, she made her debut at Unrig uh, with her son, Teddy, who stole the show. And so uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Howard Schultz and Catherine Gale. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I am so happy to be back here, but I have to say, first of all, on behalf of the room, welcome to Unrig. We wish you had come to our party last night. Was that phenomenal? What, what, did, I, what did I miss? It was a party for democracy. And one thing you missed, so it's a piece of advice I think we want to collectively give to Howard Schultz, that if he does, decide to run, he needs to have some badass grandmas for Howard Schultz. Okay, okay, hey guys. Okay. Okay, our movement is about more voice for voters and more choice for voters. And the voice in this room today is gonna come from this stage and I know we can all support that. <laughs> Howard, oh it's, it's, good. it's tough out there, right? <laughs> so. You have had a tremendous success, a tremendous success story in, in America. Why would you choose to consider this path, to run for president, and why as an, as an independent? Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for inviting me. And most importantly, thank you for the individual and collective work you're doing around political reform. The country has never needed it more. Uh, I spoke to a group earlier, uh, this, or earlier this morning, and uh, this is what I had to say. And I, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to answer the question by reading a poem. Is that OK? Yes. And the reason I'm doing that is because I received this poem uh, anonymously yesterday. And it was so powerful uh, to me and my family. And I just thought, uh, I'm going to share it with you. And uh, here it goes. The eyes of my youth never taught my heart to hate. My reality was inclusion, a world flawlessly great. But I know now that hate exists, and it is our human duty as humans to continue to resist. A grandson of immigrants, yet categorized as white, blood the same as yours, a heart that knows this isn't right. We are species of one, like a tree is a tree, whether an oak or an elm. It's the same thing to me, equally rooted, equally alive, equally needing, nurturing to thrive. I can't give you my skin, but I'll give you my voice, especially to those who don't have a choice. Take whatever platform you have, whether a knee or a stand. Equality should not be a wish, it should be a demand. May we all rise up, against the ignorance and hate, and unite as humans to make our America great. So I, I read that poem as a, a lens in which I'd answer this question. Uh, never in my lifetime have I been so deeply and profoundly concerned about the direction of the country and the fracturing of our democracy. A fracturing of values, a lack of respect, a lack of civi civility, a lack of dignity in the White House. At the same time, as I have traveled the country over the last eight weeks or so, the goodness and the kindness of the American people uh, is extraordinary. I see ordinary Am Americans every single day doing extraordinary things. But there is a large cloud 
hanging over the country, a cloud of sadness. And the sadness is real. The country, in my view, is on the clock. And what's on the clock is whether or not the promise of the country, the dreams that we have for our children and grandchildren, are going to be achieved. I grew up in public housing. I, I, mean, I am, in so many ways, the embodiment of the American dream. Um, where I came from and the odds of getting from there to this stage are almost impossible. And the only reason it happened is because we live in America. However, I ask myself every single day if the accessibility of the kids living on the other side of the tracks today and whether their station in life is going to define whether or not they have access to the dream that I had. And I'm, I'm, I question that. I'm concerned about that. And so I've stood up and said, I want to do everything I possibly can to play, pay it forward and to do everything I can to disrupt and transform the system that is not only unrigged, and my wife doesn't like this word, but it's true, it's corrupt. The system is corrupt. Something happened just a week and a half ago, and I know I'm going to be long-winded, but I think it's important, and that is the Senate Finance Committee was, was holding hearings just last week and a half ago of pharmaceutical executives. And I went back and just examined who in that room who was asking the questions of these executives was taking money from the very companies they were talking to. And it turned out that $9.5 million in that room, the fox was in the hen house. And so the question that I've been asking for a year now is, why are we unable to solve our health care problem? And the underlying issue, which is very complex, is we can't get transparency and we can't get to negotiate on pharmaceutical drugs. Why? And the answer is because it's not in the interest, the self-interest, of the politicians who are in the pocket of pharma. This is a moment in time where we must all, individually and collectively, whether you like what I say or not, whether you're for me or not, it's not the issue. The issue right now is the American people. The issue right now is that we must recognize that the gift that we've been given as Americans, which is such a gift, is not an entitlement. It has to be earned, and it has to be earned every day. We must transform the system. We must reform the system, and we must not relent. It is critically important that everyone in this room and everyone we influence around the country who we touch every day must not be a bystander. And one of the reasons is that every single moment right now, there are things going on that are undermining our very essence of what it means to be Americans. This president is undermining our democracy, our values, our way of life. And it's happening as we sit here today. This is not a time to understand that this is just, we're going to wish this away. This is going to take real serious commitment and conviction from everyone in this room and everyone we touch. Because our democracy is being threatened not only by a rigged system and a level of corruption, but a president who does not deserve to be in the Oval Office. So Howard, before I ask you the next question, I want to ask a question to the audience. It's an opportunity for us to let potential president, uh, presidential candidate, potential president Howard Schultz know what we think about ranked choice voting in this room. What do we say? Yeah. Having said that, there's a little work. We don't have it yet. It's not in the presidential election. So, not yet, but soon. So, what that means is that one of the things that you have encountered since you declared, I believe, 10 weeks ago, not declared, since the book tour began. Considered. Considered. Seriously yes, okay. considered. Um, 10 weeks ago, is that you're confronting the issue of the spoiler argument, and we don't have to explain mm. that to this room. So, is now the time, given everything that you just talked about with so much passion, 
what's at stake? Is now the time to run as an independent, or is the spoiler question just too big of a danger? No, I think now is the time to run as an independent. Uh, the country has never been more divided, and as a result of that, I think uh, the American people are longing more than ever before for truth, for honesty, and a, a different choice, a choice that they deserve. And so I, I'm undeterred by the assault that has come and the vitriolic uh, anger. Uh, but this, there's no spoiler. It's a false narrative. Uh, the spoiler is going to be, well. OK. Thanks, guys. Uh, We're going to have the voice here I, because we're for vice and choice. I, I, let, me, let me just, uh, since you're concerned about that, the reason it's not going to be a spoiler is two reasons. One. There, there are lifelong Republicans, lifelong Republicans, who, given the choice between Donald Trump and a Democrat, will more than likely vote for Donald Trump, despite the fact that the character morality of this president is inconsistent with their own values. If I choose to run, if I, if I choose to run, millions of lifelong Republicans will come my way. The other issue is, this will not be popular, but it's going to be truthful for me. The country is not ready for, the country does not want, and it would be inconsistent with our democracy if we enter a period of socialism in America. So thanks, Howard. I think you can see. I'm going to speak, to, I'm going to speak the truth. And and we're certainly a room about truth, although I think you can see it is a diverse community, many different views. But what we're united around, and that I know we share with you, is that the system is broken. In fact, I had in my hands a little bit ago a brochure that you That we're handing to. out about reform, about ranked choice voting, about the fact that the Supreme Court cannot be politicized any longer, and that if I run for president, fortunate enough to be elected, what I would do is I would not allow uh, any judicial uh, justice on the Supreme Court to be confirmed unless two-thirds of the Senate confirmed them. And that would demonstrate, that would demonstrate finally a level of bipartisanship in which we would not have ideology uh, at, through the lens of every single vote. The ideology of both parties at the extremes has divided the nation. The vast majority of the Americans are at the center. That is where we have to be. So I want to step back just on a different note. Yeah. I, uh, Howard's been reaching out to the reform community, so I had an opportunity to meet you uh, for the first time a couple weeks after the 60 Minutes uh, discussion. And after our meeting, people said, well, how did it go? That must have been interesting. And my comment was, I have never met a powerful, rich, white male CEO who listens like you do. It was extraordinary, amazing. And I've met a lot. And I think that that, I didn't know it was funny. Actually, I thought it was fabulous. I think that that is an amazing characteristic in any CEO and in any presidential candidate. So my question is, how did you become such a good listener? Well, I think, I don't think you can become a very good and strong leader if you're not demonstrating empathy and compassion uh, to the people who are trying to share with you their concerns. And if you look at the history of what we've done at Starbucks, and I say we because it's a team sport, uh, providing health care, ownership, free college tuition, is about listening to the people at Starbucks who had needs beyond their paycheck and wanted more from their company. And I think one of the things that I'll be talking about a great deal is the need for business and business leaders to do much more for their employees and the communities they serve. Because the, gov the, government, the government is not going to be able to do everything. I do believe we have the beginning of a crisis of capitalism in the country, and that needs to be refined. I, I was very disappointed to see that President Trump gave a free 21% tax rate to corporations without any incentive built in to do anything for their people. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the issue of listening right now is that, you know, I, I've been traveling the country, as you know, and I've heard so many stories. 
and I, I think the American people feel as if they're not being seen or heard or understood, and what, you know, whether they're Republicans, independents, libertarians, Democrats in the room, what must unite us going forward is an understanding that we must come together under some degree of a common purpose to unify us and take the ideology and the self-interest and the partisanship out of the political system and regain the fact that we the people, we the people, must restore our faith and confidence in one another, in the country, and for our children and our grandchildren. And, and I, I speak to that, and I, I just want to just remind you that you know the country is sitting with $22 trillion of national debt, paying $500 billion of interest expense. And for all of us here today who have children or grandchildren, it is so immoral when you think about both parties are complicit in recklessness of their lack of fiduciary responsibility. But that, that, that burden, that burden is going to be on our kids and our grandkids. And so the, the issues of the day, not only of what, what's going on and what President Trump and this administration is doing, but the work that you're doing, and I, I started off by saying I just want to acknowledge it, is so vitally important. And that whether I run for president or not, as I said to the group earlier, you have my solemn promise that I will stay with you and I will support the reform movement and do everything I can to get people in my sphere of influence engaged in what you're doing because they too are deeply concerned about our democracy and what needs to change. Is that it? I think we might just, no, it's definitely not it, because I go like this, and then the music goes down. Oh. Maybe not. Okay, so we're going to finish, though. We've got uh, a lightning round, and this actually is meant to be funny, so feel free. Okay, so who should play you on Saturday Night Live? Uh, not my friend, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> okay. And uh, do you have a Bill Clinton saxophone move prepared? Uh, I, I don't. I probably would make coffee somehow. <laughs> okay. Uh, night hour, early riser? Uh, I'm up very early, like 4.30 in the morning. Oh. Leisure travel, adventure travel? What's that? Leisure travel or adventure uh, uh, travel? Leisure travel. Wine or beer? Oh, good question. Uh, wine. And any vices after coffee? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, transparency only goes so far, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, as uh, Nick said in the beginning, you know, Howard, I brought my baby here last year. And what people may not know, you certainly don't know, he's named Teddy. I named him after Theodore Roosevelt because he was the great reformer of the progressive era. And in part, it was inspired by a quote, which I want to just, uh, you read a poem, so I'm going to do the quote thing. So, it is not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better, but the credit belongs to the man in the arena who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And this is a room of people who in their own lives decided to be in the arena. And we now have a man who's chosen to be in the arena uh, for our country. And I want to say thank you for sharing time with this thank room you. today. Thank you. Uh, Any final words? I just want to say. Final words. Uh, uh, since you've talked about being in the arena, my wife Sherry is in the arena with me. Thank you, Sherry. Our next speaker is one of the nation's leading civil rights activists, the host of Pod Save the People, and founder of Campaign Zero. He is an absolute inspiration, and we are honored to have him here with us in Nashville. Please welcome DeRay McKesson. Thank you. It is, it's good to be here. Uh, 
interesting act to follow. It was uh, five years ago since the protests began in St. Louis, uh, five long years ago. People think often that we were in the street for a weekend. We were in the street for 400 days in St. Louis. If you ever saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. It was illegal to stand still in August, September, and October of 2014. If we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. And I remind myself of that every single day to remember how far we have to go. I also taught sixth grade math, and sixth grade was by far the most incredible grade I've ever taught. Uh, sixth grade is great. If you know sixth graders, they're amazing. Seventh grade is puberty and, deodor puberty and deodorant, and it's rough, you know? <laughs> Seventh grade is hard, but sixth grade is really beautiful. And I'll never forget, I taught 60, 90, and 120 minute classes, which is a lot of math for anybody, let alone 11 year olds. And one day, my sixth graders, we, were, we had a 120 minute block, and they were like, can we go to gym early? And I was like, absolutely. Y'all need to go to gym, I'm tired, y'all are tired. The gym teacher was also the science teacher, so gym was a little questionable. So they <laughs> go to gym and they come back really quick and I'm like, why are you back so soon? And what I realized is that they're more in love with the idea of gym than the work of gym. <laughs> and I say that because in this moment, I think there's some people more in love with the idea of resistance than the work of resistance. Yeah. So I wanna spend my few minutes up here talking about some things that I've learned about the work the past five years. I'll offer three thoughts. The first I'll need you to help me with, if you were in my moderated talk, don't vote during this one because you already know the answer, uh, but uh, what percentage of arrests do you think happen in the country for violent crime? Of all the arrests that happen in the country, what percentage do you think happen for violent crimes? So raise your hand. If you think more than 50% happen for violent crime, raise your hand. In between 40 and 50% for violent crime, total arrests, you have to vote at some point, okay? In between 30 and 40%, Arrests happen in the country for violent crime, 20 and 30 percent, 10 to 20 percent, less than 10 percent, it's 5 percent. And I start there because one of the things that I learned over the past five years is that part of our work is to actively dispel myths. That what myths do is reinforce a version of the status quo that often puts people in places where they support things that actually don't loop back to solutions about systems. So if you believe that 50%, 40%, 30% of the arrests that happen in the country are for violent crime, you're more likely to believe that the police are the solution, that incarceration is the answer, but it's really 5% of the total arrests that happen in the country are for violent crime, and that's just the arrest. Less than that are actually convictions. The next thing I'll ask you is, uh, you've raised your hand, have you heard of private prisons in the country before? Most people. Uh, what percentage of people incarcerated do you think are in a private prison? If you think more than 60% of people incarcerated in a private prison, raise your hand. 50 to 60%, 40 to 50%, 30 to 40%, 20 to 30%, 10 to 20, less than 10. It is 8%. It's another thing too, and I say this because this is what happens when people who don't know the content become the storytellers. There are a lot of people who actually don't understand mass incarceration well, but they heard one story about private prisons, they started telling it everywhere, and again, what myths do to us is that they get us off track when it comes to what the real solutions at the system level are. So the first thing I wanna offer is this idea that we always actively dispel myths. The second thing that we do is we share the cognitive burden, is that all of us have been in rooms where we believe something, we say it, somebody disagrees, we give a speech, they disagree even better, we give the speech of a lifetime, they super disagree, that doesn't always work. So what I'd offer is this idea of we have to share the cognitive burden. I was on a panel once with a police officer. I spent most of my time around issues of policing. You know, a third of all the people killed by a stranger in this country is killed by a police officer. And I was saying to her, uh, she was, uh, we were talking about police violence, and she was like, Dre, are you saying that the police should never kill somebody? And I said to her, do you have a kid? And she was like, yeah. And, she, and I said, you know, when should the police kill your child? What's the scenario where your kid's gonna make a mistake that you'd be okay with the bullet through his head? She said, I don't know. I said, if you don't know, then I don't know either, right? Like, no parent should have to go through that. But I say that because it would have been easy to preach at her. It was harder to ask her a question that made her do a little bit more work, that made her actually share in the cognitive burden. When I'm talking to people about the benefit of welfare, I'm no longer talking about the dignity of people's lives and their souls. I'm saying to them, what does a four-year-old have to do to earn dinner? What does a seven-year-old have to do to be worthy of shelter? You tell me how a five-year-old proves that they should eat tonight. That is about sharing the cognitive burden with people. Part of our work has to be that. The third thing I'll say is this idea that we never let the system off the hook. 
that even the best programs in the country exist because the system failed or was unwilling to do it in the first place. The reason why we need a million after school programs to teach people how to read and write is because school failed in the first place. The reason why we need to feed homeless people under bridges is because they're homeless and we didn't make a commitment to housing. That the best programs meet immediate needs and can often help us scale up to the system level, but we never let the system off the hook. It is a systemic failure that the three biggest mental health facilities in this country are prisons and jails. We did that. We think about hunger as a political choice, not just like a manifestation of society. We never let the system off the hook. The final thing I'll say as we close is a chant that started with us in the street in St. Louis, one of the first chants I heard uh, when I was in the street, and it was no justice, no peace. So many people heard that chant, and they think about it as a threat, but we think about it as a statement of truth, no justice, no peace. This idea that any demand for peace not rooted in a call for justice is just the lust for order and compliance, that we know that the freedom that our lives deserve will never be rooted in something as basic as order and compliance. When we say no justice, no peace, we say we want a justice that we can feel and see and hear. We want a justice that says Mike Brown is coming home today, a justice that says Tamir Rice is playing with kids on a playground and that Rakia Boyd is in another cookout. We want a justice that is made real. We want something that is real in our streets, in our suites, our courtrooms, in our classrooms. We want something made real. When I think about this notion of justice, I'm mindful that people use the words justice and accountability interchangeably. But we think about accountability as what happens after the trauma. Justice is the fact that people shouldn't experience trauma in the first place. It's good to be there. Carrie Healy serves as the 70th Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts and is the president of Babson College. Her career is defined by fact-based policymaking and consensus building, and we are so pleased to have, us with her, have her with us today. Please welcome Carrie Healy. Hello, everyone. And uh, now I have to say, how can I follow that? Unbelievable. Um, so I want to talk about some of the issues that, some of the economic issues that are underlying uh, a lot of the discussions that we've already had this morning. And, and I want to talk about perhaps the next thing that this incredible coalition of people could start working on and start thinking about as they fix democracy, maybe they can think about the next thing they want to fix. So, 25 years ago, when I was raising my kids, uh, they were born into a world where, yes, we had Republicans and Democrats, but the most of us, we were somewhere in the middle. And being moderate uh, meant that you could actually have discussions across that divide between Republicans and Democrats, and it wasn't really that hard. We were all kind of bunched up. But now, if you look at where the middle is, the middle isn't smaller necessarily, but it's very spread out and very diverse. I think that we could hear that even in the room here today when you were uh, reacting to Howard Schultz. There, were, there was a diversity of opinions here. And, and yet, I think that this group tends toward wanting to find that common space. And so when we think about how polarized we've become, there are a lot of different uh, answers to that. And everyone focuses on the anger and they focus on the fear uh, that is underlying it, but I think that there is a different root cause, and I'd like us all to, to think about it a little bit today, and it was already mentioned today. I think it is that both sides have tended toward impugning our human dignity, and that some of the dangers and the flaws in our system right now are attacking our human dignity. And there have been a lot of different kinds of discussions about what human dignity means, but to me, what, comes, what it comes down to is that inside all of us, we possess human dignity that no one can take away from us. We can't give it away, it can't be taken away. And Arthur Brooks calls it the radical equality of human dignity. We all have something in us that makes us equal. 
and therefore we deserve to be treated the same way we deserve justice. And what is going on right now in the world that I think is pulling us apart is that there are both structural attacks on our human dignity and we feel that at our core. When someone is attacking your human dignity, you may not know exactly what's wrong, but you can feel it. You know that they are acting in a way that is unjust. And then also that is being amplified by the rhetoric that we are using, both from the left and the right. And I'm gonna start with the right because I have been a lifelong Republican. Right now I feel like I'm stranded in that middle zone with no party. I am one of the politically homeless right now. But I can, I can tell you that the rhetoric used on the right, especially when we're talking about economics, especially when we're talking about the poor, is very, very provocative and it attacks human dignity. And they will tell you that the reason why their policies are correct is because the poor deserve these policies and they will point the fingers at the poor for their situation. And this is one of the areas where you see the biggest divide. When you think about things that are really dividing the country right now, it's our attitudes on economics. And when you look at the left, just as the, those on the right are pointing the finger at the poor, you see that those on the left are pointing their finger at the rich to justify their policies and to say that the, the problems of our society are focused on those who have often created wealth. And so when you start looking at how is this impacting our attitudes as a society, it's having a huge impact on one of our most important institutions in America, which is our ability to create value, create jobs, create wealth and mobility through free enterprise. And we see that all of the attitudes in, in our society around these, these core issues of capitalism and big business and free enterprise, we, they are being damaged. The image is going down significantly and especially among our young people. These are the people who are gonna be the voters of the future. And to the extent that now two thirds of young people really think that socialism and capitalism are more compassionate, I'm sorry, socialism and communism are more compassionate than capitalism. And here today, you can also see that young people are very focused on corruption. That's what this is the, the, the association that is being made with these systems. And so it's very important that this group also be looking at what are the underlying beliefs here? Who do we trust? If we don't trust our economic system anymore, who do we trust? And when you're looking at it, at the institutions that are still trusted by society, what stands out here to me is that small business is the second most trusted institution in society today. And so why is that? What is it that really separates uh, small business from large business? And what is that cultural difference that we're trying to get at? Now, over half of all Americans work for small businesses. And small businesses actually uh, comprise almost all of the businesses from a percentile standpoint in, in the US. And so many of us have experience personal experience with small businesses. And when you compare it to the trust that exists for big business, which compares, which employs roughly the same number of people, small businesses win out every time. And so my question that I'd like to share with you today is what is it about the culture of those small businesses that makes them so far superior to big business in America? And what does that suggest that we should be doing? I would argue that we need to start reforming capitalism. That we don't want to lose free enterprise, but we need to change it to save it. And it's not that hard, but it starts with companies, quite honestly, like Starbucks, like Panera, you know, look, many, many companies like Whole Food, Patagonia. There are many companies that have intuitively made this leap to multi-stakeholder capitalism. They care not only about making a profit, 
but they care about the environmental impact of their companies. They care about their employees. They want to make their employees shareholders. They want to pay them fairly. They want to make sure that they have health care. And they care about their communities. And if you think about it, those are many of the same qualities that you see in small businesses, family businesses, who are deeply rooted in their communities and know their employees and want to do what's fair. The multiple between the pay for the heads and owners of small businesses and their employees is not that far off. But when you get to big business, that's where it gets spread out. And so when you talk to owners of big business about these kinds of changes that they have to make, often they say, we won't be able to be profitable. It, won't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't help our shareholders. But the truth is, the research that we've been doing at Babson College shows that companies that make these changes, they are more profitable. They have less turnover in their staff. And more people actually want to work at these companies. More people want to buy their products, especially millennials who care about the values of the companies that they buy from. <laughs> so my view is that we need to put on your agenda, maybe for the next UNRIG uh, conference, uh, attacking this notion of how do we become a multi-stakeholder capitalist country as opposed to the current system that we have. We don't want to lose the great economic engine of free enterprise, but we can't afford to be polarized by these discussions. And we need to actually take back this center argument, not surrender it to the rhetoric on one side or the other, but make sure that we ensure the human dignity of every single employee in this country, and we can do that by reforming capitalism. Thank you very much. Our next speaker not only has some pretty great hats, but was a political advisor to George W. Bush and John McCain. He's a co-founder of No Labels and most recently a co-creator, executive producer, and host of the Showtime series, The Circus. Please welcome Mark McKinnon. So good to see you. I met Nora uh, more than 10 years ago when she was a student at Westland, so it's really, uh, really proud to see you, your firm hand on the wheel, this amazing effort. Thank you for having me. Uh, I don't have any advice specifically on what the reform community should be saying, but I do have some thoughts on how you should be talking about your message. The first thing is you got to get a message right, but you got to get it tight. So what do I mean by getting a message tight? Well, uh, in 1968, when Richard Nixon was running for president against Hubert Humphrey, the average amount of time that they would get when they did a, spe a speech or a press conference was 48 seconds on the evening news, 48 seconds. Doesn't seem like a lot of time. The last election when Trump and, and Clinton run, uh, ran, the average amount of time was seven seconds. So you think about that. So that frame is you're talking to your, your candidate or your cause ahead of your organization. You say you're going to go out and do a press conference. You've got to get your message right in seven seconds. You've got to crystallize it. And usually they say, that's ridiculous. I'm talking about climate change. This is really complicated. I'm a really smart person. I'm not going to dumb it down. And then the response from you should be great. Then you're going to lose. We're not going to, we're not going to get this effort across. And that's exactly what Bill Clinton said to my friend Paul Begala uh, when he was talking to, Clint, to, to President Clinton. But in thinking about that, the reason we have a goldfish up here is because Microsoft did a study uh, some years back now, not too long ago, where they uh, determined that the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. The attention span of humans, eight. OK? <laughs> so this seven second thing kind of makes sense. And it made sense to my old friend Paul Begala, who worked for President Clinton in 1992. And they were preparing for a debate, doing debate prep. And Paul had asked him a question about the balanced budget amendment, a very big issue at the time. 20 minutes into his answer, Paul stopped him and said, Governor, whoa, you don't have 20 minutes, you have three. 
And so Clinton typically argued back, oh, it's very complicated issue, Paul, very complicated. <laughs> and Paul said, I know, I know, but listen, unless you can crystallize this in three minutes, we're going to lose. Clinton argued back again and said, okay, smart ass, show me something as complicated as the balanced budget amendment that you can frame in a way that you're describing to me. So Paul, who uh, got a pocket-sized Bible when he and I were students at the University of Texas, pulled it out, turned it to John 3.16, and read it to President Clinton. Or he, actually, he gave it to Clinton and asked Clinton to read it. So Clinton uh, takes the passage and he reads it, and it goes as follows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Paul said, there, Governor, in 25 words lasting, click, 6.8 seconds, St. John listed all the essentials of Christian theology. All of them, okay? Let me break it down. For God, monotheism, not the gods, just a God. It took humanity hundreds of thousands of years to come to the conclusion there's only one supreme being. John 3.16 covers all that ground in two words and a fraction of a second. So love the world. God is not only singular and supreme, but also benevolent, capable of affection on a global scale. He, okay, so God's the guy. Hey, St. John wrote it a long time ago. He wasn't woke yet. <laughs> Gave his only begotten son. Whoa, he's got a son, a begotten one at that, willing to ship him to earth as a gift, an enormously complicated concept, fraught with ramifications, but delivered in just five words so that whoever believes in him, having faith in this son, is a prerequisite to what comes next, shall not die, but have everlasting life. That's the payoff. Faith triumphs over everything, even death. No wonder believers call this the good news. And that's why Tim Tebow, college athlete, now pro athlete, this is when he played for the college national championship, he had three things on his mind that day. One, we're playing for the national championship, and I think we're going to win. When we win, I think I'm going to be on TV. When I get on TV, I got something to say that has nothing to do with football. It's, got, it's John 3.16. So what happens? He does his press conference. Everybody tunes in. They win the game. There's Tim Tebow, and he's got this John 3.16 in his eye black. So one of two things happen. Either you know what it is, or you don't, and you go to Mr. Google, and you get Tim Tebow's message in seven seconds. Okay? So, uh, by the way, as an exercise fairly recently, just thinking about social media, what's happening, I loaded John 3.16 into Twitter. Guess what? Exactly 140 characters. I got like a little chill. I was like, whoa, show. Guy in the sky got it a long time ago. So most important, though, in thinking about campaigns is, this, is the idea of storytelling and narrative architecture. What do I mean by that? Usually we think about storytelling through a cultural lens. And that cultural lens is books, movie, TV, Jennifer Lawrence's movies, right? Uh, but it's same, the th same is true for candidates and campaigns. Great campaigns tell a story, okay? So why is that important? Because it's not just a bunch of disparate information. Voters, like viewers, want you to connect the dots so it's a me that has meaning and has a story. So since that's true for campaigns, what that means is it's, it's usually not the most experienced candidate that wins or the smartest candidate, although it can be, as long as they know how to communicate. It's the candidates today who know how to tell a story. So what do I mean by that? The way we talk to uh, candidates and, and uh, causes about this, this is a really simple kind of classic narrative architecture, and it goes like this. You're running to do something, right? You're running to change something. Uh, otherwise, if you're happy with the status quo, you're staying home. So you identify a threat out there that's making things worse or an opportunity that makes things better. You identify the victims of this threat or denied opportunity, who's being affected by it. Identify the villains. Who's imposing it? Or it could be, it doesn't have to be a person. It could be a thing. It could be a bureaucracy. It could be a policy. Who's, who, who are the villains imposing the threat or denying the opportunity? Identify a solution, then reveal the hero. So think about that and think about the 2016 campaign, making no judgment here on who won. But let me ask the question, who told a story? Well, I can tell you really easily what Donald Trump's story was, OK? Let's just go through it. Identify the opportunity. Make America great again. Whether you agree with that or not, you knew what it was. He wanted to make America great again. 
identify the threat. Others, immigrants coming across the borders, wanting to change our way of life. Who are the victims? Middle class, hardworking Americans, mostly in the middle of America, who lost their jobs or had a diminishing quality of life. Who are the villains? Well, Mexican immigrants, rapists coming across the border, Chinese bad trade deals, media elites and DC lobbyists. What's the solution? Build a wall, tear up the trade deals, drain the swamp. Agree or not, you knew what Trump's story, what his what the story was, right? Classic architecture, you knew what the story was. What was Hillary Clinton's story? I don't know. The problem is neither did she. Okay, so the challenge for you is to develop your story, tell it right, tell it tight, go out there and kick it hard and carry on regardless. Thank you. If you were at UNRIG last year in New Orleans, you already know why we saved this next speaker for last. And if you weren't there, you're about to find out. He is a co-leader of Democracy Spring and one of the most powerful voices in the movement. Please join me in welcoming Ronaldo Pearson. Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Winston Churchill, the end of the beginning. That's what I thought when I introduced the new framework for the democracy movement at the inaugural Unrig the System Summit last year. And what a year it has been since introducing the seven deadly sins of, a democ of American democracy, and really quickly, voter suppression, voter erasure, or purges, uh, felon disenfranchisement, the corrupting influence of big money in politics, gerrymandering, vulnerable voting systems, and Trojan media, and the Electoral College. Since introducing that framework last year, we have advanced the pro-democracy and anti-corruption countermeasures to each of those seven deadly sins in over a dozen states. Automatic voter registration to counter voter suppression, same day or election day registration to counter these reckless voter purges, reenfranchisement to counter the disenfranchisement of returning citizens, independent redistricting commissions to counter partisan gerrymandering, the public financing of campaigns through small donor matching to counter the corrupting influence of big money in politics, election security and ad disclosure measures to counter vulnerable voting systems and Trojan media, and ranked choice voting and the national popular vote interstate compact to advance the constitutional and fundamental democratic principle of one person vote, doing away with the enduring vestige of our nation's original sin of slavery, that is the Electoral College. <laughs> the end of the beginning. That's what I also thought last year when I juxtaposed those seven deadly sins to the sermon that Dr. King planned to deliver before he was assassinated. Why America? may go to hell. I shared the clues he left for what he might have said in that sermon. One of those clues, now more the, than ever before, American, America is challenged to realize its dream for the shape of the world today does not permit our nation, listen, the luxury of an anemic democracy and the price that America must pay for the continued oppression of the Negro and other minority groups is the price of its own destruction. For the hour is late and the clock of destiny is ticking out. We must act now before it is too late. In sharing those clues, I submitted that sermon might be more applicable today, given the recent existential warnings, not just from the atomic scientists who updated the doomsday clock to a point now closer to the midnight end of humanity than it has been since the height of the Cold War in 1953, but also the existential warning from climate scientists who say that we face a fastly evaporating timeline to earnestly confront global warming, but even so, I still wanted to believe that this was the end of the beginning. But that was before the Parkland shooting. That was before the now infamous voter purges of Georgia's gubernatorial election. 
That was before the United Nations IPCC report that said that we now have under 12 years before it will be too late to reverse our current collision course with catastrophic climate change. My fear now is that this could actually be the beginning of the end. But there is hope, even more hope than last year. We now have HR1, the For the People Act. This federal legislation advances virtually all of those aforementioned pro-democracy and anti-corruption countermeasures, including voting by mail, to those seven deadly sins. All of the policies, one way or another, that this body has been working to advance in the states. This is what we called for when we made history in April 2016, marching 140 miles from Philly to D.C., over 1,300 of us getting arrested on the Capitol steps. We called on Congress to produce legislation required to fix democracy first. And the Speaker of the House has legislate has the Speaker of the House has now responded in earnest by making this omnibus package of democracy reforms the first legislative priority of the 116th Congress. This critical legislation has passed one chamber of Congress and has 47 co-sponsors in the other. This is a new historic floor for our movement and it's one we must build on with all deliberate speed. Why? Why? Well, though we've now advanced an unprecedented amount of pro-democracy and anti-corruption ballot measures in the states, listen to this, we've also started to see unprecedented backlash to those ballot measures by voter suppression and corruption-friendly state legislatures, as the Washington Post has recently reported. So, ultimately, as the abolition and civil rights movement showed us before, Federal legislation is needed to seal the deal of progress. And if, the, and, if, and if federal legislation is the seal of that progress, then the American Revolution, abolition, women's suffrage, and civil rights movements indubitably show that nonviolent direct action is the hand of human progress that pushes and affixes the seal to that deal. Democracy shouldn't be a partisan issue. But the Republican Party of the 1860s reminds us with their party line vote of the 13th, 14th, and most relevant 15th Amendment votes that we should never compromise with corruption. So with no illusions, no illusions about changing the mind of a particular majority leader in one of those chambers of Congress, no illusions, we must now turn to the successful strategy of the civil rights movement of the 1960s and proceed armed with the fact that America is still at the bottom of the list, number 26, for voter turnout among the 32 leading democracies in the world. We must proceed on with opinion polls that show that upwards of 80% of American voters are with us on this legislation and proceed on with the proof of concept in over a dozen states, including so-called red states like Alaska, Georgia, West Virginia that passed AVR and Montana, Utah and Wyoming that passed SDR, which moved their states from the bottom of the pack to the top for voter turnout. That's right, the successful strategy of the civil rights movement. When John Lewis, Hosea Williams, and Dr. King led the march from Selma to Alabama state capital of Montgomery, they did not set out to change Sheriff Jim Clark and Major John Cloud's mind after Bloody Sunday. Rather, they set out to generate popular pressure that would split the disenfranchisement establishment and raise public consciousness to a boiling point by nonviolently forcing the nation to reconcile the mass disenfranchisement of African Americans with America's founding documents and 15th Amendment promise. And it was this action that led to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And that's just one example. I've got more, but I'm out of time. Listen, we are all social engineers of the third reconstruction of America. 
But unlike the abolition and civil rights movement, we actually have an existential deadline. So as King reminds us, we can't afford to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism or incrementalism. Global warming won't wait. Black, brown, and young people can't wait. You heard Emma Gonzalez last night. And democracy shouldn't wait for every vote to count and for public policy to reflect the public interest. So I have three challenges to issue as I close. One, we must change the conversation around election postmortems and candidate analyses Anytime there is an analysis of an election turnout that doesn't mention the fact that 2016 was the first presidential election without the full protection of the Voting Rights Act, remind them that they do so at the risk of dismissing the blood-drenched sacrifice of the civil rights movement. <laughs> Two, the verdict is out on the reckless voter voter purging scheme that is interstate cross-check. And though Arizona and Colorado recently dumped cross-check, there are still 20 states that use it, though Eric exists as an alternative. So I challenge everyone here to go back to your states and push your secretaries of state to dump cross-check. And three, if, and this is a big if, if we set out to march in a transpartisan way, transpartisan way, country over party way, from Georgia to DC with a major escalation in DC, Democracy Spring 2.0, anybody? Supporting and advancing HR1, we need to do it together, at least at the magnitude of collaboration that we saw during the civil rights movement. Josh, you were right last night. Shared resources. That's what this moment needs right now. Last year, I called on us to employ creative synergy and realize the fierce urgency of collaboration. We need that now more than ever before. So I leave you with these words from Coretta Scott King. Struggle is a never-ending progress. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. Our time is now. The last generation faced dogs, water hoses, billy clubs, and nooses. What's our excuse? Ronaldo Pearson, everybody. You know, you all can just remain standing for this last part. Just stay up. Thank you. You've been here. It's been a long weekend. I just want to say on behalf of, of everybody at Unrig, just how grateful we are that you stayed this course through the weekend, that you've been so uh, compassionate and loving, even of difference, which is something that I think this group and this movement embraces. And I think we should give ourselves a round of applause. We don't have to agree with everybody, but we have to be compassionate and loving at all times. I want to thank the Leadership Council, uh, these great groups here, American Promise, Issue One, Unite America, uh, Vote at Home. Thank you so much for, for uh, getting behind this summit. I also want to thank a round of applause for you guys. And to our partners who helped with the programming. Volunteers, I was going to ask you to stand up. Jump up and down, volunteers. Where are you? Yeah, thank you, volunteers. Um, the, I wanted the, the folks here at the, the Nashville Music City Center, the, the security guards, the caterers, the food service people, the security team, a round of applause for them. And I want you to save your biggest applause for the Unrig staff that wish none of this would have happened. And Nora Gilbert, get up here, get up here. This is the powerhouse right here with a handful of others that just did it all. Thank you. All right, you guys. I got my voice back enough just to talk for a minute. Um, obviously, we're all feeling pretty good right now, yeah? You feeling good about the summit? 
Okay, good. You need to be feeling good. But as you know, and I said this last year, I'll say it again. If you leave here just feeling good and don't make a commitment to doing something, nothing changes. Right? Everything Ronaldo just said doesn't change unless you do something about it. And so what I want to do with this big group of people is the same thing that we actually did with our staff to start the summit, which is I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes for a minute and make a commitment in your mind to what you will do when you get home because you have to do something. And it's just going to be five seconds of silence. The next time you're frustrated with a political enemy, the next time you see injustice, the next time you see something that you need to change, you need to come back to that moment and the experience you had here and carry it with you. If you are a representative staffer, will you please make your way to the front of the room so we can give you the applause that you deserve? And I think it's only appropriate that Nora have the last word, please. I think I've gotten far too much credit as being the organizer of this event, and I want everyone to recognize these people 10 times more than I've been recognized. And Abby and Matt in the back. Abby, who's been back there. The whole AV team, thank you. And thank you all for coming.